Praise the Lord. It is a joy to worship our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we continue our series through Galatians 5, specifically the fruit of the Spirit, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians 5. And we're going to look at, at verse 23. We have now made it out of verse 22. Praise the Lord. I, we have been in verse 22 for quite some time, weeks upon weeks, and now we are able to move on to verse 23, which is a joy. But I will read verse uh, 16, and then go down and read verses 22, 22 through 24. <coughs> the Apostle Paul says, verse 16, in Galatians 5, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let us go to the Lord in prayer and ask that He would enable us to understand His truth. Oh God, how I ask for help, O oh Lord, as I preach Your Word. Give me unction to make known the glories of Christ. Father, for each and every one of us, may we be transformed by the Word. Those of us in Christ, may we be made more like Him. And those who are outside of Him, I pray this morning that You, by Your Holy Spirit, would draw them to Christ. That they would be born again. That they would be saved. And Lord, that ultimately you'd be glorified through the preaching of your word and the gospel of Christ. Lord Jesus, indeed, nothing compares to the promise of the gospel. Nothing compares to the promise which is in you. The promise of eternal salvation. And so it is to you we pray would be brought glory forever. Amen and amen. The title of this is Christian Virtues as we continue this series. And we're looking at gentleness. Christian Virtues, gentleness. Brethren, we find ourselves living in a, a culture where the idea of a gentle spirit or someone who is meek and lowly of, of dis disposition is despised. In other words, someone who is a, a gentle person it's considered something that is foolish. People lack meekness. They lack a quietness in their spirit. They lack a graciousness about them. In fact, it seems that every week in the news, we behold another story. Perhaps people rioting in the streets, protesting, or people debating political topics or economic issues, and there is always a lack of gentleness. Why? Why are people like this? Well, as we saw this morning in our Sunday school lesson, people are dead in sin and they desire sin only. But brethren, we are not. We are not dead in sin. God has raised us to spiritual life in Christ. We are born again. And for us, this is attainable. Gentleness is something we can grab hold of. It is something that God has, in fact, bestowed upon us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does biblical, Christ-honoring gentleness look like? What are its attributes? What are its manifestations? What is its source? We will obtain knowledge about this in this sermon. We will see what its attributes are, where it comes from, and how it manifests itself in our lives, that we might be able to have it more abundantly. But before we do, brethren, let us contemplate the context of this verse. We know that the book of Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in Galatia, which was a region of the Roman Empire. And so he's, he's writing to multiple churches, and it's about a simple, a very simple doctrine, and yet it is the thrust of the New Testament. And it is that salvation is by faith alone. The Reformers called this sola fide. In other words, we are saved by faith alone. 
in the finished work of Christ alone. The Judaizers had come to Galatia, as we've recalled almost every week, we've looked at these fruits of the Spirit. We've recalled that the, that the Judaizers came to Galatia telling the Galatians this, in order to be saved, you have to keep the law of Moses. In order to be a true Christian, you have to work out your salvation. You've got to pull yourselves up to God by your own bootstraps. They even criticized the character of Paul, as we know. And so Paul comes back with strength, with precision, with truth, and he puts forth the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1 and 2 is Paul defending his ministry. Chapter 3, uh, chapter three and 4 is Paul defending the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And then chapters 5 and 6 is Paul is drawing upon the implications of this truth. He is, he is saying, Galatians, here is what this is going to look like in your life. Here is what someone who is walking in genuine salvation in Christ is going to look like. And chapter 5, as we've seen almost every week, breaks down beautifully into three sections. The first being that uh, Paul labors on this point. Circumcision is of no benefit. As the, as the Judaizers told the Galatians, you must be circumcised to be saved. And he labors that no. First part of the chapter, verses 1 through 12, he says no. The, third, uh, the second part of the chapter, verses 13 and 15, is about love being the fulfillment of the law. And then chapter, or excuse me, then the third part of the chapter, verses 16 through 26, is a very profound and I would say the most important part of this chapter to understanding what really the point of this book is. You don't need the law as a Christian because the law has been written upon the heart by the Spirit. The Spirit enables obedience. See, religion, a religion around the world, teaches people do this, do this, and don't do this. It's an outward conformity. But genuine Christian religion, the, the, the Christian uh, religion, the, the, the religion of the Bible, is where the, God writes the law upon the heart. You want to know if someone's a genuine Christian is whether they live in obedience to the law of God without anyone having to tell them to do it. That is a genuine Christian. Someone who has to be told how to behave is not a genuine Christian. They're religious, but they're not born again. That's exactly Paul's point, is that the Spirit does it in us. In fact, verse 16, he says, walk by the power of the Spirit. Verse 17, he talks about the battle between the flesh and the Spirit. Verse 18, which is a key passage. Verse 18, he says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The point of the Spirit's ministry is to cause us to walk in obedience to the law, but we don't have to be told. It's, it's, just, an, it's just an immediate result of salvation. I remember when the Lord saved me when I was genuinely born again. That was one of the first things that happened in my life was I just began to walk in obedience to God, and I did not have to be told it. In fact, I couldn't point to you places in the Bible where it told me to do things. Certain things like abstaining from, from bad language or abstaining from drunkenness or um, abstaining from pornography. I, didn't, I couldn't show you in the Bible where God told me not to do those things. But I knew because the Spirit had written it upon my heart and my mind. That's the point. And then he, he enumerates in verses 19 through 21 what the fruit or the deeds of the flesh look like. And then in verses 22 through 23 he says, here's what the Spirit's ministry is about. And then as we saw in verse 24, he says, okay, if you belong to Jesus, those deeds of the flesh that he just talked about are gone. And he says it again in verse 25, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us walk by the Spirit. These have strong implications for the Christian life. Last week we saw faithfulness, and that was a blessing. That was a, a tremendous blessing for me to, to, to look at that fruit and see faithfulness as it, as it, as it operates in the Christian life. So now that we have a, a very good, strong foundation of where Paul is coming from, let us look at the text at hand. Verse 22. Or excuse me. Uh, yeah, we'll start at verse 22. He says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Verse 23. The first fruit there, gentleness. Gentleness is translated from the Greek word protes. Protes. And protes means mildness of disposition. A gentleness of spirit. In fact, uh, it can be better translated meekness. In fact, meekness is, a, is probably a better translation. Uh, John MacArthur agrees with this conclusion. In, in his uh, study Bible, he said this, uh, this. This word, gentleness, is better translated meekness. It is a humble and gentle attitude that is patiently submissive in every offense. 
while having no desire for revenge or retribution. In the New Testament, it is used to describe submission to the will of God. That is genuine Christian gentleness. It is a meekness. It is a mildness. There's a quietness of spirit submitting to the fact that God is sovereign and even submitting to the fact that He allows for people to do evil against us. That's a mark of a genuine convert. It's someone who doesn't get angry when, they, when someone offends them. Doesn't get angry when someone persecutes them. Doesn't get angry when life goes hard. That's one of the, te that's one of the, the telltale signs of someone who is, who is falsely converted is when things start to go hard in their life. Immediately they flee from Christ. Instead, a genuine Christian runs to Christ. That's why Scripture talks about how tribulation produces in a Christian proven character. In fact, the King James Bible translates this meekness. Meekness. And I, and I like that. I would agree with the King James there. It's a, it's a more accurate translation to the Greek. In fact, uh, you know, probably throughout the sermon, I'll, I'll, I'll interchange... Meekness and gentleness, because they're, they're basically synonymous, but I would say, again, meekness is a closer fit and a better translation. You can think of it like this. Gentleness is the outworking of meekness. Gentleness is what happens when you have meekness in the soul. See, meekness is something that is inward. It really describes the inward man, the spirit, the mind, and then gentleness is how that works out in your life. You can think of it like this. Gentleness is the refreshing water and meekness is like the beautiful natural spring from which it flows. Because when we're meek, then it works out that we are gentle. We're gentle toward our fellow man. And we are, we are submitted to God's sovereign will. In fact, uh, just a couple other terms to give you an idea. We, we want a full-orbed understanding of what Paul's talking about here. Here's some, some synonymous terms. He uses, or uh, excuse me, uh, here's a synonymous term, timidity, humility, mildness, submissiveness, which I like. Very, very profound submissiveness. So let's examine Christian meekness. Let's see what the, the whole testimony of God's Word has to say about this. It's a huge subject. In fact, it could take me all day to go through every, every text. It's a, there's a vast sea of biblical truth. But what I want us to do is take the cup, and I want us to just dip it in and grab a little bit of water and refresh our souls. Just a portion of what Scripture has to say about this. So it's the first thing is the command. That's the first thing we're going to see. The command. This is implicit. This is commanded. If someone is a Christian, this is commanded of them. Verse 1 makes that clear of chapter 5, verse 16, of verse 22 to 23, verse 25, verse 26, makes it clear that this is an expressed command. This is an imperative. There's no option. You can't say, well, gentleness just isn't my gifting. You can't say, brethren, that, well, gentleness is just not my strong point. You're called to it, brethren. You're commanded. In fact, I'll... Just go a few verses down into chapter 6, verse 1. What does Paul say in verse 1 of chapter 6? Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in what? A spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. And guess what Greek word he uses there? Protes, the same word. Exactly as verse 23. Jesus commands this also, uh, Matthew 5, 5, one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Peter says it as well in 1 Peter 3. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Proverbs 15 as well. The Old Testament agrees with the New. Proverbs 15, 1 says a gentle answer. Turns away wrath. I've seen this happen so many times on the streets. Whenever I engage people and I'm having a conversation with someone and they're angry. In fact, just the, just the other week, a lady comes up to me. She interrupts the sermon. She was very upset. She says, what are you doing out here? This isn't, this isn't effectual. And she gets, she was very, she was wound up. She was upset. And it was amazing. God, by His grace, enabled me to be gentle with this lady and be very gracious. And in a matter of moments, she went from here way down here. She, she had calmed down. And by the end of the conversation, we, we had actually um, been quite cordial throughout the, most, of the, most of the conversation. So the scripture is fulfilled in that, brethren. Let, let us be gentle. 
Let us be gentle to those who are not toward us. Again, someone who is not saved or a false convert. That, that's one of the things you're going to notice about their lives. Is that if someone, let's say someone gets angry at them or, or, or if they're offended by someone, you're going to know it. There's not going to be gentleness. There's not going to be a gentle reaction. There's going to be anger. There's going to be maliciousness. There's going to be lack of forgiveness. There's going to be gossip and slander. Because those who are in the flesh, as Romans 8 says, cannot please God. Cannot. You must be gentle and meek, brethren. Just as a soldier must be brave, just as a doctor must be brilliant, just as a lawyer must be learned, just as a president must lead, just as a janitor must clean well, so too must a Christian be meek, humble, and gentle. Secondly, let's look at the characteristics. This is really where we're going to, we're going to spend most of our time this morning. Characteristics. Let's consider what, what is genuine gentleness. Firstly, it is humble. And as I said earlier, humble is a, is a synonymous term, but it describes what gentleness or a meekness of spirit really is about. It is a humility. It is thinking of oneself in the right light of Scripture. Understanding they are a depraved, dead sinner. And the only reason there's anything good in them is by the grace of God. Paul said that I am what I am by the grace of God. In fact, um, humility, you could say the term humility defines further what meekness is. Galatians, or excuse me, Ephesians 4. Verse 1, Paul says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Right there, those two terms are conjoined. They are attached and nothing can separate them because they define one another. In fact, uh, they're not only conjoined there, they're conjoined also in the book of Colossians. Colossians 3. Paul says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. A good illustration in a Christian's life what humility would look like or meekness. Let's say, for example, one of you, dear brethren, felt that the Lord was laying upon your heart to go out and proclaim the gospel in the streets. And so you decided to visit a side of town which was definitely not safe. A lot of homeless people made their abode. And you decided to share the gospel with the meek and the lowly. Those who are filthy. That would be a display of meekness. Because we know we are just as evil as they are. We are just as wicked as they are. We are just as vile as they are. But God holds back our wickedness as we saw this morning in our Sunday school lesson. God restrains the evil of men. And so who are we to think we're any better than them? Brethren, are you humble? Are you willing to humble yourself and do things? Are you willing to serve your Lord in humility? Or you who are lost? You who hear the words which I am speaking who are unconverted? Are you proud? Of course you are. Certainly you're proud. If you're outside of Christ, you, you are the most proud person you can be. Because you think... But you're good. You think you're inherently good, but Scripture says you're evil. Or you false converts, you who think you're a Christian, but you're not. You're the, one of the chiefest, most proud people. You need to be saved through Christ. As it is written, God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. God resists those who are proud. God resists those who are self-confident, who are self-righteous, who are trusting in their decisions, who are trusting in walking an aisle, who are trusting in saying a prayer, who are trusting in some words of a preacher, who are not trusting in the finished work of Christ, and whose life is not focused on bringing Christ's glory, but instead fulfilling their own lusts. God is opposed to that person. What a terrifying thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God. Secondly, humility is joyful. Uh, or excuse me, not humility, but, but gentle, uh, meekness is, is joyful. Meekness is a joyful thing. It's not something we're just sitting around in our spirit, we are depressed. It is something we, 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 we walk in with joy. 
Because it brings joy. Here's why. Because we understand we're nothing in God. God has done it all in us. And He is our hope. He is our focus and our joy. Think of, if you would, meekness is the engine and the output is joy. The, the energy output would be joy. Actually, it's interesting because when you think about when we are prideful, when someone is prideful, they strip from themselves any joy. Those who are humble are the most joyful. In fact, we know that. We see it in our own lives. Brethren, I'm sure each and every one of you could testify to someone whom you've known, perhaps an older saint or even a younger saint, who was meek of spirit. And they were always so joyful. They always had a joy and a, and a peaceableness about them. That's because that's the result of humility. It's a result of meekness. The focus is Christ. Thirdly, meekness is God-focused. As I just mentioned, it is focused upon Christ. Its attention is God. God is the chief pursuit of the believer. God is the chief pursuit of the genuine Christian. Again, that is an evidence of someone who is not saved. Is God is not their chief pursuit. God is not the one whom they live for. God is not the one whom they pursue. God is not the one whom they live for. They live for themselves, for their own pleasure, for their own good, for their own life's plans. They're not living for the glory of God. That's what Jesus said. If anyone has to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. Is Christ the one you're coming after? Or do you treat salvation... As if, it is a, as if it is a ticket. And you simply get at one point in your life and you're good. It's a dangerous spot to be in. Brethren, has God been your chief pursuit? Has the Lord been your focus? Has, has drawing near to God been what you live for? If it is not, repent. Come to Christ. Paul, look at Paul. Surely Paul was meek, and surely Paul was humble. Surely Paul was gentle of spirit, and he was filled with joy because Christ was his pursuit. Listen to the listen to listen to the spill out in his language. Philippians three. You don't have to turn there. Philippians three, verse eight. Paul says, "More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ." And may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. What was Paul's life all about? Was it being successful in ministry? Was it winning people to the Lord? Actually, no. His life was about knowing and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, this is the one whom we chase after. This is the one whom we do all things for. We wake up early in the morning to seek Him. We die to self every day to seek Him. We put to death sin to seek Him. He is worthy of our adoration. He is worthy of our focus. In fact, what's our, what's our motto of this church? The, 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 the slogan is to bring, is for the glory of God. This church exists to bring God the glory. Brethren, you and I exist to bring God the glory. And even you who are wicked, who are ungodly sinners, and who are on your way to hell, even you exist for the glory of God. You were created to bring God glory. In fact, you were created to worship. You who are lost, you are created to worship. And here's the thing, you do, surely do not worship God. You worship your own appetite, your own self. And that will bring you straight to the pit of hell. To the pit of destruction. Oh, oh friends, let the, let the smoke of hell burn your eyes and your nostrils as you behold it. For it is real. Is this true of you, brethren, that you're seeking the Lord every day? 
It's Christ to pursue. If he was never your pursuit, if he was never the one whom you sought after, surely you were lost. And those flames, the eternal flame, burns awaiting your destruction. Hell, brethren, hell is real. We need to warn sinners about this. We need to warn people. We are in the Bible Belt, brethren. We need to, we need to nail this point down. That the churches are filled, pulpits are filled with people who are going to hell. We need to warn them about hellfire. Because we care for them. What's the most loving thing we can do, brother? Is to warn someone. If we were walking down the street and we saw someone going to a burning house and it's going to collapse at any moment and they're ignorant that it's going to collapse <coughs> on them, would we not warn them? Would we not cry out to them? Of course we would. Anyone in their right mind would cry out to them. Anyone in their right mind would say, Stop! Don't go! Don't burn! Don't lose your life! And we cry out to those who are headed for hell and say, Turn and live! For the flames are stoked. Listen to the groans of the, of the damned. Listen to their moaning and their screaming. And they're crying out for a drop of water to be given to them. And it will not be given. Listen to those who are undergoing the torments right now in the place of fire. As the screeches of the lost, the eternally damned, cry out. And they blaspheme God. If you've never believed upon Christ, do it. Or, lay, or, or, be, or be damned eternally. Be lost. Don't be lost. Fourthly, genuine meekness is, because it is God-focused, genuine meekness is God-glorifying. And as I said a moment ago, what is our chief end? The Westminster Shorter Catechism, first question, what is man's chief end? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. This is the point. We are to bring God glory. Brethren, let your heart be focused upon the glory of God and nothing else. And do not take a... Do not take a glimpse off of him. Do not move to the left or the right, but stay on the narrow path. Psalm 115, verse 1. We actually looked at this at our prayer meeting on Wednesday. What did the psalmist say? Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. To God alone be glory. Fifthly, genuine meekness and, and gentleness of, of heart, it manifests toward our fellow man. Not just God focused, but it is also focused, directed toward our fellow man. When they offend us, we respond in gentleness. When a genuine Christian is hurt, you know what they respond? They don't respond with anger. They don't respond with even arguing their point. They, they respond, well, I don't want to say arguing their point, arguing their case trying to fight for their rights, they simply respond in gentleness. When a genuine Christian is slandered, they respond in gentleness. When a genuine Christian is uh, scolded, when they are made to look like a fool, perhaps by even other Christians, or someone who is unconverted, they respond in meekness, gentleness, and humility. When they are despised, when they are hated, and when they are persecuted, when they are led to the stake to be burned, for the cause of Jesus Christ, they respond with gentleness. Brethren, what do we have just posted up over there on the bulletin board? A picture of John Knox. Or excuse me, not John Knox, John Rogers. The first English martyr for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as he was led off to the stake to be burned for the cause of Christ and his wife and ten children falling behind, watching him be led off to the stake to be burned, does he respond back with vile responses? Does he respond back by cursing those who are going to kill him? No. He stands for the truth of the gospel. And he is killed for his faith in Christ. We live in a time that is so dangerous. You know why it's dangerous? Because it is so easy to say you're a Christian. It is so easy to say you are born again. Because you won't be persecuted. There's no hardship here in America. We 
have everything easy. In fact, if you say a Christian, you might get a promotion at work, especially here in the South. Especially here in the South, where everybody has the trappings of outward religion. Everyone goes to Southern Edges Church. Yeah, we're the one of the most ungodly nations in the world. It's one of the most dangerous things. I, I hope God brings persecution in this place. So people who keep claiming the name of Christ would stop doing it, and they would stop bringing reproach upon Christ. I was with a brother just a few days ago, and he told me that when he met his wife, she was an unbeliever. She was a false convert. She said she was a Christian, but she was a hypocrite. Drunkenness, partying, drugs, or I don't know, drugs, but sexual morality, whole nine yards. She's a typical college student. And he called her out. And this is before they were married, obviously. Way before they were even close to getting married. He called her out. And he only told her. He presented the gospel to her. And then he said this. I want you to go home tonight. I want you to think about this stuff. But he said, I want you to do something immediately tomorrow. He said, I want you to go to everyone on this campus. And everyone you've ever told that you are a Christian to. And tell them you're no longer a Christian. And you no longer claim to be a follower of Christ. So you'll stop bringing reproach upon the name of my Lord. And I thought, wow. That's so true. That's what we ought to do, brother. We've got to go around telling people who claim to be Christians, stop calling yourself that. You're not. And you bring reproach upon Jesus' name. What's one of the Ten Commandments? Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. People think, oh yeah, that just means don't say, oh my G-O-D, or just don't say, uh, don't go blasting God's name. You know what that also means? It means taking the name of the Lord upon yourself and treating it, and trampling it underfoot. Saying, okay, I'm taking the name of Christ upon myself, and I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ, and you live as though He get, never gave you a law to obey, as though He never gave you commands to live by, and you live as though He never even existed. People say they're Christians, they live like atheists. Sunday Christians only, or Sunday and Wednesday only. I want to say to those people, if you're one of them, stop saying you're a Christian. Just stop. I want you to say it. I want you to consider these things. But just stop saying you're a Christian. Because you make it hard for me. You make it hard for genuine Christians to share the genuine gospel for the glory of God. You make it so difficult. In fact, the Bible says that to the Israelites who claim to be followers of God, but they were hypocrites, God told them, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The name of Jesus Christ is blasphemed around the world because of false converts, because of false Christians. People who do not possess genuine gentleness. Brethren, let us possess this genuine, this genuine Holy Spirit wrought gentleness. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5. He says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Let us pray for those who persecute us, brethren. Jesus said elsewhere in Luke, in Luke 6.35, He says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Let me give you an example. This is an example of Christian genuine gentleness. Hudson Taylor, many of you have heard of him, missionary to China in the 1800s. He was a godly man. He served the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, he was a genuine Christian, and he possessed an abundance of meekness. I'll quote you uh, a section uh, on a website, uh, an article I read about this story. It says, the British, now this is when his ministry is, has already been established in China. And this is toward the end of the 1800s. It says, the British Parliament called for the return of all the missionaries from China. So you had a bunch of missionaries over there. It says, in the wake of an attack on their missionary premises during the Yangtze riots of 1868, there had been some riots that, that, had, that had sprouted up in China, and there, it was becoming civil unrest, and it was being violent. People were being killed. And so the British Parliament, the government in Britain saying, bring these Christians back over here. They're going to get killed in China. You know what the article says? It says, Taylor refused. It says years later, during the Boxer Rebellion, CIM, that's the Christian, the China Inland Mission, that was his missionary organization, suffered the worst loss more than any other mission in China, with 58 missionaries and 21 children killed, slaughtered in China. Listen to this, listen to what he says. He refused to accept payment for the loss of property and life because he wanted to show the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Brethren, that is to a coward that I cannot begin to explain to you. 58 adult missionaries and 21 children killed. 79 people killed. 
And he says he wants to show them the meekness and gentleness of Christ, which we will look at in a moment. Brethren, are we this forgiving? Are we this gentle toward those who seek to bring destruction upon those who follow Christ? Now I want us to look at something very important, and that is gentleness and tribulation. Because this, this meekness that God produces within us, this connects very strongly to tribulation. As we saw at the beginning, this meekness is a submission to God's will. It is a submission to the will of God for our lives. Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 2, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on in chapter 4 to talk about persevering in trial and tribulation. And that's where we get the famous text in uh, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Brethren, it's because God has given us a gentle, quiet spirit that when trial comes upon us in our lives, when hardship comes upon us in our lives, our mouths are shut. What can we say? God, why do you allow this? How could we say such a thing? God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And brethren, we know the promise of, of, of Romans 8. God works all things for our good. Brethren, do we realize the love that God has for us? Do we realize the love that God has manifested toward us in Christ? That He so loved us. And brethren, everything happens in our life happens on the basis of God's love. Even trials. He's wanting us to be conformed to the image of Christ. We know that in Romans 8, God predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. We know also from Ephesians 1, He predestined us to be like Christ, to be holy. This is the point. So when trial comes upon your life, brethren, do not despise it. See the hand of God in it. See the love and mercy of God in that work in you. In fact, I would say that if you have a life filled with tribulation and trial, you are most loved of God. You are most beloved of God. Because He is desiring to see you more like Christ. More and more and more like Him. And that can only be through fire affliction. Metal can only be manipulated as it is heated to a molten state. And smashed with a hammer over and over and put back into the fire. Run out and smashed again. Brethren, this is how we are conformed to the image of Christ. When trial comes upon you, accept it with joy, with gratitude. In fact, I've already learned as in my life as a believer that God has not promised me an easy life. He's promised me a hard life. And it is a joyful life. It's hard, it's difficult, yes. And you encounter people who despise you. You encounter rejection even by your own family. But brethren, brethren, who are we accepted by? We're accepted by God. But let, let that bring us joy. We are receptive to God's will in whatever happens. In fact, I love to go back up. As I quoted at the beginning, that note from the MacArthur Study Bible. Again, he says, better translated meekness as we saw. He says, it is a humble and gentle attitude that is patiently submitted excuse me, submissive in every offense. In the New Testament, it is used to describe submission to the will of God. Brother, do we have this? Do you, have, do you possess this? Do you grab hold of this? Perhaps you don't. Again, as I said earlier, a mark of someone who is a hypocrite and not a Christian is that they will flee Christ the minute something bad goes, uh, goes about in their life. As a telltale sign, someone knows not the love of God. Brethren, as, as Paul exhorted us in Galatians 6, 1, as he said that we are to restore someone who sinned in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to ourselves so that we will not be tempted. Brethren, we need to look to ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, do we possess this? Do we have this toward man? Do we have this toward our God? And when we, are we receptive to His will? Are we focused on Him? And are we exalting Him in this? The true Christian is adorned in gentleness and meekness. As a flower is with the most gorgeous petals. A Christian is clothed in this. And lastly, I want us to look at the gentle nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gentle nature of Jesus Christ. In these closing moments, I want you to consider with me 
the source and fountainhead of genuine gentleness, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The chiefest, one of the cheapest, chiefest and most grand features of our Lord Jesus is that He's clothed in gentleness. Matthew 21, verse 1, Paul, um, the Apostle Matthew writes, When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethage, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to, into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. So the context here, Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem for the last week of his life. In fact, we call this a triumphal entry. Verse 3, it says, If anyone says to you, you shall say, or excuse me, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. And in verse 4, Matthew gives commentary to what Jesus says. He says, Then this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. Brethren, Christ came in gentleness. What did we look at this morning in our Sunday school? What did we consider? That Christ came not to judge the world, but to save. Christ came to seek and to save those who are lost. You can't seek after God. You cannot. You will not. It's not that you are held back. It's because you will not seek after God. And Christ must seek after you. If you're going to be saved, Christ must seek after you. But that's exactly what He came to do. But in His second coming, we know that He is coming to destroy and to judge and to render wrath. When he first came, he did not come to do that. But the second time he comes, he's coming to do that very thing. So he comes clothed in meekness, clothed in gentleness. Brethren, brethren, run to him. For his elect, for his church, he is so kind. Think about a caring husband who loves his wife so tenderly. And with all gentleness, brethren, that is what Christ is toward his church. He loves His bride. He loves His people. Come to Christ for cleansing of sin. You have sin in your life. You're struggling with a, a sin in your life. Flee to Christ. He's gentle. He's gracious. You desire further holiness. You desire further consecration. You desire to be righteous. Flee to Christ. He'll do, you. He'll do that to you. He'll make you more like Him. And you will have that same gentleness and meekness He has in you. He's the fountainhead of it. He's the source. We know from Isaiah 53, He came as a suffering servant. He came as one who was coming to suffer for the sins of God's people. That on the cross, God unleashed His wrath upon His Son for the love. Out of love for His elect. Christ did not come as a king in the sense to be exalted. Not an earthly king. He came as the king of glory. The king of the kingdom of God. In fact, he told the ungodly, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my servants would be fighting. Brethren, the kingdom of God is not of this world and Christ came to suffer for all those who would enter into his kingdom. In fact, we see in the gospels that there were times when Jesus was so liked by the crowds they wanted to make him king. And he resisted it. Because he came as a suffering, humble, meek servant. You who are lost, O oh sinners, repent and believe. You who are falsely converted, you who are delusional, you who are deluded, you who have clothed yourself in a false religion. It is not the religion of Christianity, it's the religion of damnation. You who are lost, flee. You who are lost, run from your sins. Flee to Christ. Be saved from your sins. Be saved from this wicked generation. The flame is stoked. The wrath is kindled. I said Christ came the first time to be gentle and to be gracious and to be merciful and to be meek. But the second time He comes, He is coming to render judgment. He is coming to bring wrath. He is coming to bring judgment upon those who reject the gospel. 
In fact, this is, this is exactly what he says in Matthew 7. Listen to Matthew 7. Jesus says in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those are the most terrifying words in Scripture. How do we know whether we are one of those people? Verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Verse 20, so then you will know them by their fruits. You want to know how you'll know? You want to know how you can know that someone is, is in Christ? Is you'll know by their life. You'll know by the way they live, by the way they talk, by the way they behave. You will also know if you're one of them, ask yourself this, what does my mind most think about? That is your God. That is what you worship. What does your mind most dwell upon? Because that is your God. Many people worship, but they do not worship the God of glory. They do not possess Christ. And what did Jesus say? He said, He who has the Son has life, but he who does not obey the Son does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on them. Oh, as I encouraged you earlier, consider the moans of the damned. Consider those who are in the place of torment right now. Jesus said, Hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brethren, uh, and people are ungodly alike. Have you ever stumped your toe? Have you ever hurt yourself? And the pain was so excruciating. You, you, you uh, gnashed your teeth together. You perhaps even wept out of pain. Brethren, that is hell every moment. That is what hell is every second. It is those being tormented day and night. Jesus said, is it a place of outer darkness? You ever been somewhere so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face? You ever entered into a cave that was so dark? That is hell, but worse. In fact, that's bright compared to how dark hell is. Uh, 1 Thessalonians tells us that hell is a place that is away from the Lord and the strength of His might. It is cut off from the grace of God. You are, you are bathing in God's grace right now. You are bathing in God's grace. Every breath you take, every heartbeat that you have is a gift from God. Every blink of your eye is a, is a gift of mercy. And you tread it underfoot. You tread it underfoot lightly. Because it will soon be taken from you. The offer of salvation is limited. The offer of genuine, true salvation is a limited offer. Because it will only be for a few moments, and then it's gone. <clears throat> but the worst aspect of hell, the worst aspect of hell, is told to us in Matthew 25. I'd like for you to turn with it, there with me. Matthew 25, 46. Jesus says of the ungodly. Jesus says of these sinners. Verse 26. These will go away into eternal punishment. That is the, the most terrifying aspect of hell. There is no hope for those who are in hell. There is no, absolutely no hope. They are there forever. They are locked into the dungeon and they will never be punished. In fact, listen to verse 41. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 41. It says, then the king will answer and say to them, or excuse me, I'm sorry, verse 41, I was reading verse 40. Verse 41, it says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. That's the reality of you who are outside of Christ. Just think about that. Think about a man or a woman who this very day, this very moment, is taking their last breath and they're going to step into the eternal pit and there's no hope. Brethren, preach the gospel. People must be saved. What else are we living for? We must win souls. We must cry out to God in prayer that He give us spiritual children, that we would have people who would come to the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through our ministry. This life will pass away. The cares of this life will pass away. The material possessions of this earth, money, clothes, cars, whatever, it will all burn. It will all be destroyed. But the man's soul is on forever. What will it gain you if you lose your whole soul? In fact, brethren, 
and you who are lost alike, consider this. Would you sell your eye for a million dollars? Would you sell both your eyes for ten million? No one in their right mind would because their eyes are precious to them. Their eyesight is something which they would do anything to keep. In fact, I have a friend who uh, it was the one who went out with me evangelizing on, on Thursday. He's almost totally blind. And he was still evangelizing. <coughs> so I don't want to hear any excuses about not being able to evangelize. He was out there, hardly couldn't see. In fact, he says a lot of times people walk right in front of him and can't see them. But he can barely see throughout his peripheral. He says in front he can't see anything. And so the handout tracks, he kind of stands like this, looks off to the peripheral. Just a godly man, loves the Lord. But brethren, you know, you consider this saint. Think about how much he'd pay. Think about how much he'd give to have his eyesight back. I'm sure you're going wrong. How much more your soul? How much more that which can not be regained once it's lost? That's why hell is so horrible, because it wants your hair. There's no stepping back. I, I, I'm, I'm just, just astounded by all these ridiculous stories you hear. You know, someone writes a book or someone makes a movie. They say, oh, I went to hell for 20 minutes and then God let me come back. No! You're, once you're there, you're there. There's no coming back. In fact, if someone went to hell and they came back and they were able to even smile, I'm suspicious. I'm suspicious. I don't know how anyone would be able to. Once you're there, there's no going back. So what is the result? What, what is the... What is the, the prescription to this issue? What is the solution to this dilemma of hopelessness? It is Christ the Lord. He is gentle. He is offering salvation today through the preaching of the gospel, through the ordinary means of the, the proclamation of good news. Christ stretches forth His hand and says, All who will come. Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then He says, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And in that same passage, He says, For I am gentle and humble in heart. Christ is gentle and meek and lowly. He has come as a, as a, as a suffering servant, to suffer for his people's sin. But I want to, in these closing moments, if you would go to Revelation 19, I actually referenced this passage earlier, but I want us to get a picture of what Christ will be like when he returns. He will not administer gentleness to the ungodly. Revelation 19, listen to verse 11. So just picture, just picture John standing there and seeing this as he writes these words. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, listen to what he does. He judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. Those are his crowns. That would be a crown. And, on his, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads a winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Flee to the ark of salvation, for the flood of God's wrath is coming. And no one can swim. No one can be sustained on that day if they are not in the salvation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. The righteous run into it and they are safe. So we have seen here the gentleness and the meekness of a genuine Christian. We have seen that it is commanded. We have seen its attributes. And we have seen how it operates in trial. We have seen the gentleness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what this, and as we consider in these last moments, the cross of Christ, which is the chiefest display of God's gentleness. Because God is holy. God is righteous. We've seen that. God is just. He must punish sinners. Christ is coming as, the, as, the, as the, the warrior king. And God has put forth His law and we cannot keep it. None of us can. He said not to lie. Well, there goes everyone because we've all lied. God says not to steal. Well, there goes everyone because we've stolen. 
God says you shall not murder. And Jesus said if you have anger in your heart towards someone, that is equated with murder. Just three we fall short of. And so we are condemned to hell, but God in His mercy sends Christ His Son. His love toward mankind, His gentleness toward His people is revealed in His Son. And Jesus comes and fulfills the law and then is, is crucified, is nailed to the cross of Calvary, and is slain under the wrath of Almighty God. He absorbs, He placates, He propitiates God's wrath against sin. And He is raised on the third day, exalted in celestial glory, and He is seated there now in heaven, now, what a sinner must do, and brethren, you know this, what a sinner must do, and we need to proclaim this to the world, they must repent and believe the gospel. They must turn from their sin, turn from their iniquity, turn from their hypocrisy, turn from their idolatry, and trust on Christ alone. Grab hold of the promises of God as they're revealed in the gospel. As it is written, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited to him his righteousness. If you're lost, believe the gospel. And the result is that you will be a new creation. The new nature will be given to you. And you'll be born from above. And you'll be saved from your sins. Do not lose your soul. And I say this because I love you so much. I don't want you to perish in your sins. Believers, let us never forget the gentleness God has shown toward us in Christ. Because the moment that God granted us the grace to repent and believe, we were forgiven of all our sins. We were wrapped in the righteousness of His Son. We were clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. That we are clothed in His righteousness, not a righteousness of our own. And we know we will be accepted. We know we will go to heaven because of His merit and not our own. You who are lost, put your trust in the righteousness of Christ. As Jeremiah 20, uh, 23, 6 says, He is Yahweh to sit canoe. He is the Lord our righteousness. Do it. To God be the glory for this. To God be the glory that He grants His people gentleness. That He gives us gentleness and meekness and humility. And that it is all revealed in Christ. The perfect display of God's gentleness. That God, though He was hated, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, though He was reviled, though He was scorned, though He was betrayed by men, and He was hated. As we see in Romans 1.30, as we see in John chapter 3, he in his meekness did not fight back. He did not revile them back, but he received the stripes for our salvation. And it is to the Lamb of God who was slain be glory, honor, and praise. To the God of all grace, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, one in three, three in one, the glorious mystery, the creator of all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, what can we say? What can we say but thank you, Lord God, for your word, the precious power of the word. Oh God, may our lives be transformed. May we be sanctified, those of us who are in Christ, and those who are lost, may they be found by him this day. May the Spirit draw them to Christ. Oh God, be glorified in each of us. Be glorified in the gospel as it goes forth week in and week out from this pulpit. Be glorified in this church and in all the churches of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.